With today's sermon in our series, Faith Lived Out Loud, Studies in the Book of James, here's Senior Pastor Mark Rader. Have you ever uh, listened to one end of a phone conversation? You know, possibly you've been on the train and someone has decided to have a conversation on the phone, probably much too loudly because you're trying to sleep, uh, or uh, your husband or your wife or your children or whatever are on the phone and you kind of overhear their conversation and you can kind of guess who they're talking to and what the questions are that are being asked based on the answers that you're hearing on one end. You've done that before? I'm not sure it's a game, but you know, if it were a game, you've all played that before at some point, I'm sure. When, when we encounter a letter like James, we're essentially doing much the same thing. We're listening to one end of a conversation. Uh, scholars talk about uh, the epistles and the letters as being occasional documents. In other words, they were written for a particular occasion. And so what we have with the book of James, for instance, is his answers, his comments, his teaching uh, addressing certain issues. And so we have to kind of guess what's going on on the other end, right, based on what we hear from this in, in, in that sense, which then raises a fairly interesting question. Because James here goes pretty hard, doesn't he, uh, at uh, the inseparability of faith and works, right? You can't have one without the other, James says. Faith and works must go together. Which suggests that on the other end of this conversation is a group of Christians who are basically going around saying that you can actually have faith without works. Which is really weird, isn't it? I mean, James is not teaching something brand new here. Uh, this is not some sort of radical teaching that no one had ever thought of before. In fact, if we had time, I could take you to hundreds of passages in the Old Testament which demonstrate the significance of faith and actions working together. Now, all the way through the Old Testament, the people of Israel are continually confronted by the prophets about the fact that the things that they claim to believe are not being worked out in their actions. When you get to the teachings of Jesus, it's much the same. How will you be able to identify and recognize false teachers, Jesus says? By the fruit of their lives. You'll be able to figure out from their deeds the sorts of things that they believe and what's true and what's false. How will people know that we are the disciples of Jesus? By our love for one another, by our deeds. So James is not kind of saying anything bizarre or new, but he's addressing a group of Christians who kind of think that somehow you can separate these. Even Paul talks about the importance of faith and the connections with works. But it's here where I just want to pause for a moment, and we're going to wade out into some kind of theological waters. It won't get very deep, and we're going to get back out pretty quickly. But let me just kind of wade into them a little bit. Because when we get to someone like Paul, who is addressing a different kind of setting, a different circumstance, we actually come into a place of, shall we say, some contrast and conflict, potentially, between Paul and James. If you have your Bibles with you and want to look very quickly at Romans chapter 3, another letter, this one written by Paul, in Romans 3, verse 28, he says this, For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from observing the law. And the Greek terms underneath observing the law are works of the law. Then in uh, James chapter 2, verse 24, that we've, uh, we're working through today, James says, you see that people are justified by what they do, and the Greek word is their works, and not by faith alone. Discuss. This is theology right here. Now, the, the problem essentially, and I don't want to take too much time to kind of deal with this because it drags us away from James's purpose, but can I just point out that this is only a problem if James and Paul are in a conference call 
with one other person, if I can go back to that little image, right? If one person had asked both Paul and James and said, listen, what's the connection between faith and works? And Paul answers, like he does, that a person is justified by faith apart from observing the law. And James said, no, no, no. You see that people are justified by what they do and not by faith alone. Then you'd have a problem, wouldn't you? Because you'd have two very different answers to one problem. But in reality, Paul is addressing a completely different circumstance. For Paul, one of the issues that he's grappling with is the inclusion of Gentiles in the church. For those of you for whom that, that term is unfamiliar, for Jews, the world was divided into two groups of people, Jews and everybody else. And everybody else were Gentiles. And so the question arose in the early Christian church, how did Gentiles get into the church? How do they become Christians? And this is how some of them did the math. They thought, well, if someone is going to begin to follow Jesus, who was a Jewish teacher, who was the fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures, who talked about the, being the fulfillment of the Jewish law, then someone to become a believer in Jesus probably needs to start by becoming a Jew. And so they taught that Gentiles needed to be, become Jews first, to become obedient to the law of Moses, uh, symbolized in circumcision in particular, and then they could become Christians. You can see how the sense it sort of makes. Paul's point was that that is not the case, that Gentiles are justified or declared righteous, not by obeying the law, but by placing their faith in Jesus. And it's not just Gentiles, it's everyone. That's where justification lies, justification by faith. But then the rest of Romans, if you took the time to read it, Paul has no qualms at all about talking about the very significant outcomes of having faith in Jesus and the kind of life that you should then live, about the actions that are appropriate and fit for those who claim to have faith in Jesus. But you can see that they're answering very different questions. And because they're dealing with such different sorts of circumstances, we can kind of leave that kind of theological deep water for a moment, wander back onto the shore, and ask ourselves the question that we started with, which is, what sort of a group of Christians thinks that faith and works are disconnected from each other? Because this is what James is addressing. He's not talking about Paul. He's not talking to Paul. He's writing to a group of believers who somehow, as he suggests, have said that you can have faith or you can have works. You don't have to have the set. Isn't that a bizarre thing? So what is it about this, this community of faith that leads them to this outcome? And let me again take you back to the beginning of the letter of James, the kind of the opening section in chapter 1, verse 2, where he begins this letter. He says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. This is the context. We don't know the precise details of the kind of opposition and persecution that they are experiencing, although we got a hint in chapter 2 that it's come from those who are wealthy and powerful in their community, that they're suffering in some way, shape, or form for their faith, their faith in Jesus, and that seems to have been putting pressure on them to turn the volume down on their actions and their deeds. You can see how this works, can't you? If the thing that's getting you into trouble is being overtly Christian, if by your actions you're copying flack from the wider community, then the easiest way to avoid that is to just turn down the deeds, isn't it? And all of a sudden you have this kind of more private, internalized faith that nobody out there notices as much and you are off the hook, at least in the world's eyes, but not so much from James's perspective. Now, before we kind of go too far, let me just also suggest, as one commentator does in chapter 2, the favoritism that was going on within the, the early community. So last week we had a look in chapter 2 and the favoritism for the rich in particular. And one commentator suggests, and we don't have enough of James's conversation to kind of work this out for real, but I think it makes some sense that part of what may have been going on was that they had become a, a community of faith, being opposed by the wealthy, unbelieving community in which they lived, 
they had also then gained some wealthy people in their church. And that part of the favoritism was actually to say to those wealthy people that the expectations for your discipleship are less in order to keep them. Does it make some sense? So imagine if we're a group of uh, somewhat oppressed believers, and we're being oppressed by those who are powerful and wealthy and those who have status in our community, and all of a sudden we're joined by those who profess to have faith in Jesus, who are also wealthy and powerful and have some status, and they may be able to help us. When we're being exploited, they may be able to step up. When we're being dragged to court, they might be able to provide some assistance. And the temptation is pretty real, isn't it? To then say that the expectations on them are not nearly as high. All that stuff about Jesus talking about, you know, selling everything you have and giving it to the poor, that's, that's, a, uh, that, that's a metaphor. That's a metaphor uh, for life. It's not, that's not real. You don't, <clears throat> don't worry about, about, about that. You can see how this works, can't you? And, and I think we can fall into the same kind of trap, can't we? Perhaps not in the same kinds of ways. But, you know, it's easy for us to turn the volume down on our actions and our deeds, isn't it? And well, what we end up with is this kind of private, internalized, devotional faith. Well, I read the Bible at home, and I pray at home, and, and that's where, where I do my relationship with God, and then I go out into the world, and I just try to be a good person, try to be a nice person, which reduces the plan of God, doesn't it? It suggests that God's end goal, his, his big idea, is that he might have good people, nice people, which is just a travesty of what God is about, isn't it? God doesn't want nice people. He wants new people. He wants people who are conformed to the likeness of Jesus so they will participate with him in his mission to change everything and renew everything in Christ's name. And when we lower the bar of expectations, of what it means for us to, to live a faith out loud, when we keep lowering the expectations, it therefore has implications on our accountability for one another. A couple of months ago, I mentioned how difficult it can be for us to talk about issues of faith and discipleship one with another. It's just a really difficult thing. And part of it is because we've lowered the bar so much. So that it all comes down to, do you read the Bible a bit? Do you pray a bit? Do you show up to church every so often? There's not much left to talk about after you've asked those questions, is there? I don't even have to ask the third one. You're here. So what else do we talk about? <clears throat> Well, the, the, the weather and politics, if you're brave, and, you know, sport and kind of what you're doing next, and that's all we've got. So James is not just talking to a group of kind of weird Christians in the first century who hadn't quite got it right. There's a reason why they kept the book of James, because it speaks to us too. And James's message is, is, is pretty straightforward, isn't it? It's not very complicated. He essentially says that faith without works is incomplete. You can't separate them out. And this is exactly what he goes on to say, isn't it? He says, faith without deeds cannot save you. And he means salvation. Now, here's another place where we kind of need to distinguish a bit between Paul and, and between James. Uh, there's a sense in Paul's writings in particular where salvation is kind of a now event, right? That's, that's kind of done, in fact, Paul uses the term justification or to be justified, which is essentially the translation of the word that means declared righteous. And Paul uses it in a judicial sense. In other words, God, as the judge, declares people righteous on the basis of their faith in Jesus. It's this kind of once for all action that's accomplished simply by faith. James, however, uses the term justified, shall we say, in its more usual sense. See, normally in the Bible, in the Old Testament and in the New, people are declared righteous in a moral sense. In other words, I watch your lifestyle, and if you continue to act righteously, I declare you righteous. I, ba I basically look at your lifestyle and say, if you live righteously, then I can declare you righteous. That's, that's the sense that James uses. 
And like the writer to the Hebrews, there's also a sense that salvation is not just a once-off here and now, but it's something that we attain to, that we inherit, that we must persevere to. It's not simply a matter of kind of a one-and-done option. There's more to it. James says this kind of a faith, a faith that you claim that you have, but doesn't have any works, it, it cannot save. It is utterly useless, as useless as saying to someone who has not enough to eat and not enough clothes and say, God bless you, I hope you stay warm and well fed. What good is that going to do somebody? What are your well wishes going to do for someone who has nothing to eat? Nothing. Nothing. That's what faith without deeds is like. Faith that cannot be demonstrated, that can just be explained or described in terms of propositions and things that you hold to is demonic, James says. I mean, honestly, even the demons believe that there's only one God. They've got their theology right. Their orthodoxy is correct. It's their orthopraxy that's the problem. Uh, they don't live it out. In fact, he says, you know, the demons at least shudder at the thought of judgment. You don't even do that. You're just kind of cruising along as if faith is enough just by itself. Let me just kind of pause here for a moment and make two, two kind of statements about things that James is not addressing here, but what might be worth mentioning. First of all, what we believe is incredibly important for what we do because our actions are driven by the things that we believe. We see it all the time in people's lives, don't we? You can tell what people believe about themselves or about the wider world or the society in which they live by the things that they do. And so what we believe about Jesus uh, and about the kingdom of God is, is important, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, but James is not addressing a group of people who don't have the right ideas or the right beliefs. He's writing to a group of people who think that that's enough. The second thing to point out is that I think that there is um, room and scope, shall we say, for what we might call deathbed conversions. Remember the story of the thief on the cross next to Jesus, right? Says, you know, remember me when you come into your kingdom and Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. I don't think James would say, well, he didn't have any works to go with that faith, did he? So that didn't save him. Right? I think that there is, there's a significant component of faith in relationship to salvation that is important to affirm. But James is not writing to those on their deathbed. But he is writing to those, as far as he's concerned, whose faith is on its deathbed. Because they claim to have faith without deeds. If you cannot demonstrate, if you can't show it to me, James says, then it's pointless, it's useless, it's idle. And then he gives these two examples of Abraham and Rahab. Uh, Abraham is the, the father of the faith, um, and you know, Paul uses Abraham as well. But here James points out that Abraham was justified by his actions. He was declared righteous, not in a judicial sense, but in the moral sense. Because all that he did, he proved, and again, and again, and again, most completely when he bound Isaac on that altar, that his faith in God was true. He was declared righteous. His faith was made complete. And isn't that an interesting thing that James has to say? Because from the very beginning, he's hoping that they will become complete, that they will endure the test of their faith, that they might become mature and complete and perfect. And here he raises it again. He wants his hearers to become perfect. He wants them to become mature. He wants them to become complete as they endure trials with their faith still lived out loud in an overt sort of way, and now, through their actions, their faith might be made complete. I mean, Rahab, a kind of a curious example, she's kind of your stereotypical non-Israelite, isn't she? And she's a Canaanite, she's a prostitute, she's kind of everything that, to some degree, the people of Israel were not to be. And she professes her faith, she says what everyone in the area already knows, that God has rescued Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, that he parted the sea, that he has given the land of Canaan to the people of Israel, and that they're going to destroy everybody. Everyone knew that. That was the profession of faith. What saved her? It wasn't telling the spies that she knew that God had given them the land. It was protecting them and sending them off in another direction. Her actions and her faith worked 
together to save her. The phrase working together, which you find in verse 22, is actually the, the Greek term underneath it is the one that we get uh, the word synergy from. There's a synergy. There's a synergy between faith and actions. They need to work together. And when they work together, they create something better than either of them could do on their own. Faith without deeds, in one commentator's language, is a stalled faith. You ever have a car that stalls, like continually? I think everyone does. It's your first car. For me, it was my second car, right? It stalled heaps. It's a fantastic learning experience. But it was a lousy car. Because a good car gets you from point A to point B, not only safely, but shall we say, continually. Stopping every four or five kilometers down the road is not the purpose of a car. It's not meeting its full potential. It's not, it's all, it's not all it ought to be when it does that. It's, it's, it's like this with faith. A faith without deeds is like a flower that never blooms. It's like a plant that never kind of turns, it begins to produce fruit. I don't know how many of you have seen the Toy Story movies with Pixar? The underlying assumption of Toy Story is that toys were meant to be played with. And if a toy is not being played with, it has not achieved its purpose in life. To be a toy in a museum is not to be a toy. Toys are meant to be ruined through play, aren't they? That's the point. Faith without deeds is like a toy that's not being played with, just sitting in its box, looking good. It's not the point. The point of faith is that it works, that it does something, that we can see and observe it in people's lives. This is James's point. So if we are to be those who want to keep the volume turned up on our actions, then what does that look like for us? And can I suggest that a lot of it has to do with what we believe about Jesus? You know, sometimes we can reduce the plan of God to, to just Him wanting a bunch of nice people, as I've already talked about. And sometimes we can equally reduce the work of God and the work of Jesus to, to being just about forgiveness. I need to be careful here, because forgiveness is a fairly significant part of what Jesus did, isn't it? But it's always struck me, as I think quite important, that when Jesus bursts onto the scene and begins His public ministry, when He begins to preach, do you know what He preaches? He doesn't preach the forgiveness of sins. He doesn't talk about his death until much, much later on. You know what he preaches when he first shows up? The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, for us to become part of the kingdom of God, for us to become incorporated into the family of God, it was necessary for Jesus to die. It was necessary for our forgiveness, but our forgiveness was not to end when we got forgiven. God's plan was not that a whole bunch of people would say, hey, I'm forgiven, I'm going to heaven, isn't that great? His plan from the beginning was that the kingdom of God might come on earth as it is in heaven. The Holy Spirit has not been poured out onto our lives in order just to assure us that we've been forgiven. The Holy Spirit has been poured out into us to empower us and enable us to bring about the kingdom of God. And if that is what we believe, if that is our faith, that the kingdom of God is coming, that Jesus, the King, is returning, that He has given us all we need, including the commission to do as He has done, then our works become fairly straightforward, don't they? And what kind of works match that kind of faith? Well, probably some of the stuff that James says, don't you think? Caring for the poor and the marginalized, bringing justice to those who have not experienced it, living our faith in such a way that it becomes evident that what we believe is true in our lives, that all may know that we are Jesus' disciples, and by our actions come to know and love him like we are learning to know and love him? Don't, don't our actions then become somewhat simple? Thousands, thousands, myriads 
of, of simple actions, from small and large acts of service and love, of kindness, of gentleness, of self-control, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives brings the kingdom of God to bear. But only if we will allow that faith to work together with our works in order that all may know. You've got to be careful which conversations you listen to, lest you get caught up in them. We hope you've enjoyed today's New Horizons program. You can download the companion study guides for each program from the Guy Mayer Baptist Church website. Go to guymerebaptist.org.au forward slash New Horizons. These are available for each episode, or you can download the whole series. Guy Mayer Baptist Church in Sydney Southern Suburbs is a contemporary evangelical church seeking to serve our local community and help them to know Jesus. At the heart of all we do is the desire to help people love God in all aspects of their lives. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can do so by the contact page on our website or visit our Facebook page. Our faith and our works are meant to go together. There's a synergy between them when we allow our faith to be worked out in demonstrable ways in our actions. And this is what James is addressing, not only in his original context, but for us today as well. It can be so easy to allow our faith to become quiet, personal, internalized, and to forget or to become content with that. We sometimes forget then that what God calls us to is to be participants with Him in bringing the kingdom about. And if we're going to be doing that, we need to be those whose faith is evident and demonstrable to all. So I trust that you've been encouraged and challenged today, and we hope to see you soon. God bless. Thank you.